Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Authors at Google event with Lee Siegel. Mr. Siegel's work has appeared in various publications, including The New Republic, where he currently serves as a senior editor. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Columbia University and was the recipient of a National Magazine Award in 2002. Mr. Siegel is the author previously of two collections of essays and a recently published critique of internet culture against the machine, being human in the age of the electronic mob, which hopefully all of you are now holding in your hands and which I think is especially relevant to, to us here at Google. Um, he'll be speaking about the book and then taking questions from you. If you do have a question for him, please wait for the microphone to arrive as we are recording this event for YouTube. Um, after the event, Mr. Siegel will be sticking around to sign books for anyone who happens to be interested. So with that, please join me in welcoming Lee Siegel to Google. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I originally came from dark, blustery New York, uh, driven by an adversarial spirit, determined to ruin your sunny California day and your utopian uh, life here at Google. But after this wonderful lunch and a tour of the campus, I, I would like to exchange copies of my book for Google shares uh, and, a, and a position. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the flyer describes this talk as the case against the internet, and, and I think that's, that's a radical overstatement. Obviously, no one in his right mind would seek to make a case against the internet. It's, it's as much a part of our lives as, as shoes and socks uh, at this point. But I want to make a case for examining the internet more rigorously, <coughs> uh, more honestly, I, I want to make a case for looking at it the way a generation of people looked at other transforming technologies like radio and television. I, I don't really see any criticism, any rational, uh, substantial criticism of the internet. And you, you certainly won't get it in the mainstream media where they, they don't have the sang froid, the confidence that you have here because the mainstream media is all quaking in their boots. They're terrified of the wave of the future. And you say internet to the most powerful editors at the New York Times, and they just jump out of their chairs because everybody wants to ride the wave of the future and not be swept away. And it's the mainstream media who are most afraid of this. And it's the mainstream media where you would really get uh, substantial criticisms of the internet. So I, I think that maybe this is the right place to begin a critique of the internet. This is the place uh, where you really have the confidence, the insouciance, even, to radically examine this, this new technology. Maybe there's a future deep throat among you uh, who will talk to a, a Woodward and Bernstein of the internet in the future. You could have Googlegate, you know. <clears throat> uh, that's a joke. I don't, I don't want to turn anyone. But anyway, I, I, I want to just read a little bit from my book uh, and, then, and then jump into the question and answer period, because I think that you probably have a lot of, I hope, a lot of criticisms of my criticism. In this passage, I, I, I talk about, I'm especially concerned uh, in my book with this concept called prosumerism. Do you know this word, prosumer? It's a word coined by Alvin Toffler, who, who wrote Future Shock, published it 30 years ago. And he, by the word, he means a fusion of the producer and the consumer. So uh, he's talking about Web 2.0. He's talking about the internet's participatory culture. Uh, he's talking about a culture in which uh, no, nobody really has any leisure time. Everybody's either producing or consuming. And my concern is that in this culture, in this participatory culture, every, everybody's swept into the marketplace. And nobody has any leisure time. Nobody can sort of sink into themselves. You know, nobody can be inner directed anymore. Do you remember there was a, a, a book decades ago written called The Lonely Crowd by David Reisman, a sociologist? In this book, he, he made, a, 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 at the time, a very famous distinction between inner directed personalities and outer directed personalities. The inner directed personality just takes uh, you know, signs from his own, his own conscience. He proceeds from his own uh, inner thoughts. He's, a, he's an original person. He, 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 he doesn't look to others before he makes a decision. The outer directed personality won't do anything that's not approved of by the crowd. He, he only wants to do the most popular thing. He wants to do the thing that has the widest appeal. That used to be that the outer directed personality was a kind of 
stigmatized personality. Now, I believe that it's become the respectable personality. And I think that the web has hastened this, this other directed, outer directed person. In my book, I talk about uh, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point. And I, I don't like this book because I think this book is all about teaching people how to market themselves to other people. It's all about looking to the crowd first and then looking to your own instincts. One of, one of Gladwell's disciples, James Sirwicky, wrote The Wisdom of Crowds. I feel very old-fashioned if I tell you that 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 I I hear that and I get I get like all all shaky inside. I, I get I, I start to panic because I don't trust crowds. I don't think there's any wisdom in crowds, and in fact I think if you get more than two people in a room, the politics become so intense, the ego politics, the ego dynamics, the 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 the, 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 the jockeying for for status uh, and 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 power that. It, it, the whole situation changes. It, it becomes psychological. It becomes, uh, you know, uh, very problematic. So, a crowd simply multiplies all the all that complexity exponentially. And I trust the individual, and I think changes come from the original instincts of the individual. I I, I don't think that a Martin Luther King could have. And now I'm going to say something that, that I, I hope I'm not violating a taboo, but I don't think he would have become a person in a culture that privileges page views and popularity over, over every other quality. So that, that's, that's my, my bee in, in, my, in my bonnet. Uh, I think popular culture is giving way to popularity culture. I think popular culture used to draw people to what they liked and popularity culture draws people to what everyone else likes. And that, and that makes me nervous also. So this, this passage is, is kind of about that. With the internet, culture, I define culture broadly as any shared public expression, never ends. For over a hundred years, high culture has been merging with popular culture, but now all experience is available, available as a form of culture. I'm thinking of YouTube, for example which means that there are no criteria for judging these, disjoint, these disjointed echoes of each other except their popularity. And what drives popularity is a routine success in merging with the mass, in extending the most generic and derivative appeal. On the internet, you must sound more like everyone else than anyone else is able to sound like everyone else. Exaggeration, intensification, magnification of proven success become highly effective means to success. The loudest, most outrageous, or most extreme voices sway the crowd of voices this way. The cutest, most self-effacing, most ridiculous, or most transparently fraudulent voices sway the crowd of voices that way. A friend of mine calls this mega-democracy, meaning democracy about to tip through perversion of its principles into its opposite. I call it democracy's fatal turn. Actually, the, the friend who said that to me was Norman Mailer, whom I got to know in the last <coughs> uh, year of his life. And I, I wonder what, what the YouTube culture would have done with Mailer, uh, because you could take moments from Mailer's public appearances and make him look absolutely ridiculous. And on YouTube, you, you can find uh, clips being played over and over again of his famous headbutting uh, with Gore Vidal on the Dick Cavett show. And, I, and I, I wonder what, this, what the internet culture would do with this original personality. I think he would uh, be made to look rather ridiculous. I, I think the ridiculous is, is exalted. It has a very high appeal uh, on the internet. Look at the, uh, at the Huffington Post expose of Obama. You all remember that, right? Just, just a few weeks ago, the bitter clinging remark that a so-called citizen blogger snagged, and now it's all over. Uh, the, the internet, it was just bracketed from something he said. This was a person who supposedly was on Obama's side. But taking it out of context like that made it a very successful item on the internet, but made it humanly very disheartening because it, what it actually did was, was drain from Obama the vitality of his complete context as a person. And I, I, I see on the internet with mashups and so on and so forth. I, I see a lot of fun, a lot of pleasure. This goes without saying, right? But I, I, I also see a kind of schadenfreude, a kind of thrill in taking down the public figure, making him or her appear ridiculous. 
I think it satisfies the, the, the disconnected, uh, lonely, isolated ego, but it doesn't help society at all. Another one of my, one of the bees in my, my deranged bonnet uh, in this book. There was always one chief difference between popular or high culture and commercial culture. <clears throat> the former, even at their crassest and most profit-driven, were meant to be enjoyed disinterestedly. Whether you were watching a play by Sophocles or attending a concert by the Beastie Boys or reading a book by Danielle Steele, you had no material interest in what held your interest. You were in the experience for the pleasure that comes either from high arts absorption of your attention or from popular arts gifts of diversion. In both cases, you were briefly sprung from the, from the daily pressures of self-interest. You laid yourself and your ego aside in one degree or another. Commercial culture, on the other hand, is all about the gratification of your self-interest and it involves the total engagement of your ego. The success of a commercial transaction lies in your ability to project yourself into the scene of the transaction. Assertiveness, initiative, full participation in every aspect of the deal that has a bearing on your self-interest, those qualities are what carry the day for a buyer or seller, not passive enjoyment of the situation unfolding before you. At the heart of a successful work of art, high or low, serious or so-called, or popular, lies something fresh and other, some type of original experience. At the heart of a successful transaction, on the other hand, is the satisfaction of your self-interest. At the heart of a successful transaction is you. With the rise of participatory culture, 2.0 culture, pop culture has entirely merged into commercial culture. Enchantment of the imagination has given way to gratification of the ego Vicarious transport out of yourself has given way to yourself. It's not just YouTube that's about you in this new order of things. It is every cultural experience that is about you. Welcome to the you, Y-O-U, universe. Welcome to the world of the internet. I think that's what bothers me about the worst aspects of the blogosphere. Again, I'm not this is not an attack on the blogosphere or the, the internet. I, I, I acknowledge the, the marvels and the miracles of, of, of the internet and the blogosphere in my book. It's, a, it's, an, it's a, an attack on the, the darkest aspects of the internet. And I think one of the problems in the blogosphere is, is, is a problem of the first person. I think the country is experiencing a, a national crisis in the first person. We're surrounded by the abuse of the first person. It's, ve it's very hard to use the first person in the right kind of way. If you flip the printed eye over, it looks like a barbell. And it's so hard to lift that eye in just the right expressive way. We're surrounded by expressions in the first person, the age of the memoir. I think the ascendancy of rhythm over melody in music is the ascendancy of first person over third person. I think melody carries you out of yourself and rhythm drives you deeper into yourself, into a kind of fantasy life. I think close up in film is the rise of the first person. And I think that the first person is so prevalent now in journalism also. The reason is that we can live, we can inhabit someone else's life more easily, vicariously, if they're writing in the first person. If they're speaking in the third person, we have to get out of ourselves along with them. We have to meet on some common ground of reality. And I think that's harder and harder for us to do. And so the worst parts of the blogosphere, the worst aspects of, of the blogosphere, are these screaming, self-conscious, inflated eyes, this abuse of the first person. Uh, and I think that that's another thing uh, that the internet, at its worst, promotes. It drives us deeper into ourselves to the point where we're, we're online, and really, we're projecting ourselves out into the world. The whole world sees, seems a projection of our of our first person. I mean, we're, we're communicating in a chat room with an alias. We're using an alias. We don't hear a voice. We don't see a face. We don't know where they are in space or maybe even in time. And so we have to fill in the blanks. We have to project. And we act out. And they're acting out. And they're projecting. 
And as all of us know, who've been in a relationship, once you start projecting too much, that's where trouble begins. So part of my book is a critique of, of self-absorption in the form of this inflation of the first person on the internet. But it's also, in the end, a critique of technology, a, a, a kind of warning not to rely too much on technology, which I think has to be, again, scrutinized uh, and examined. And I think that the changes that have happened through the internet have happened faster than any other technology. Everyone always says to me, oh, you know, you're a Luddite. You would have said the same thing about the printing press. You would have been sitting in a cave and wringing your hands over the introduction of the stone tablet and so on and so forth. But those things happened over great periods of time. It took 300 years after the invention of the printing press for this technology to seep down from the scholar's cloister into the hands of the ordinary person. Radio, television, the telephone also took decades for these things to really permeate society and change people's lives. The internet has revolutionized people's lives in, in what, 15 years? Something like that? So in this, in this section, which, which maybe is a little bit hyperbolic, uh, I, I, I talk about the, the suddenness of all these changes. It's called Through the Looking Glass. <clears throat> what would you have said if I had told you 10 years ago, that there would soon come a time when anyone with something to say, no matter how vulgar, abusive, or even slanderous, would be able to transmit it in print to millions of people, anonymously and with impunity. How would you have reacted if I had said that more drastic social and cult cultural changes were afoot? To wit, powerful and seasoned newspaper editors cowering at the feet of two obscure and unaccomplished 20-somethings, terrified that this unassuming pair might call them, quote, douchebags, unquote, in a new gossip sheet called Gawker. An obscure paralegal in Sacramento, California, who often makes glaring grammatical mistakes on his blog, becoming one of the most feared people in American literary life on account of his ability to deride and insult literary figures. High school kids called administrators editing entries in a public encyclopedia, Wikipedia, of course, entries that anyone using an alias could change to read in any way he or she wanted, writers distributing their thoughts to great numbers of people without bothering to care about the truth or accuracy of what they were writing, writers who could go back and change what they wrote if they were challenged, or even delete it so that no record of their having written it would exist. You would have laughed at me, I'm sure. Maybe you would have thought that I was purposefully and ludicrously evoking Stalin, who rewrote history, made anonymous accusations, hired and elevated hacks and phonies, ruined reputations at will, and airbrushed suddenly unwanted associates out of documents and photographs. You might have said, what point are you trying to make by saying that our American democracy is moving toward a type of Stalinism? How trite to compare American democracy to its longtime nemesis using crude inversions, are you some sort of throwback to the anti-American new left? And what if I had, to your great irritation, which perhaps is what you're all feeling now, persisted and told you that anyone who tried to criticize one or another aspect of this situation would immediately be accused of being anti-democratic, elitist, threatened by change, and pathetically behind the times. That's to stick to polite expressions. If I had told you in, that in fact, because of these risks, few people ever did offer any criticism, the gospel of popularity had reached such an extent in this upside down world that anyone, even powerful distinguished people, cringed at the prospect of being publicly disliked. What I've been describing is the surreal world of Web 2.0, where the rhetoric of democracy, freedom, and access is often a fig leaf for anti-democratic and coercive rhetoric, where commercial ambitions dress up in the sheep's clothing of humanistic values, and where, ironically, technology has turned back the clock from disinterested enjoyment of high and popular art to a primitive culture of crude, grasping self-interest. I'll read one more section and then take questions, just in case you're, I'm lulling you to sleep. This is the end of the book where I, I talk about technology and my, I express my, 
uh, my sense of disquiet about technology which isn't examined. I mean, technology is neutral. It, 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 because it takes on the character of the people who use it. It's neither good nor bad. And what I'm afraid of is this new technology that's not, that's not being examined, scrutinized, discussed. I talk a little bit about pornography, which takes up, I don't know, what, 70% of the web, 80% of the web, <clears throat> internet porn. And I talk about the similarities between pornography and technology. In a sense, pornography and technology are joined at the hip. They both transform the reality outside your head into means whose sole end is convenience. Pleasure is convenience as physical sensation. Technology is a blessing and a miracle, but it will not lead you to other people as finalities, as ends in themselves, existing outside your needs and desires. We all need each other as means. We need each other as instruments of help, sustenance, and pleasure. But without experience each other, experiencing each other as an end and not as a means, we will lose our freedom to live apart from other people's uses for us and from ours for other people. The world around us will shrink to ourselves as the only reference point in the world. Yet the world will still be there, but we will no longer understand it. We will no longer be ready for it. Most of all, we will no longer be patient with it when it fails to fulfill our most superficial and our most selfish desires. Technology without human and humane content is a round trip with, one, with just one familiar destination. Commenting on the breakthrough of scientists at the MIT Touch Lab, who sent a sensation from Cambridge, Mass, to a man in London wearing a glove attached to a computer, one radio announcer said, and I'm quoting, inevitably then, the fingertip touch the scientists experienced this month will blossom into a full-blown bodysuit. In fact, there are companies working on that right now. That will be the moment when communications technology fulfills its ultimate potential to connect us entirely, antiseptically, and, with, and without fear of judgment or rejection with the person we most desire." End of quote. There is one person in the world who connects with us entirely, antiseptically, and, and without fear of judgment or rejection. He is at the very heart of our desire for convenience. He is at the other end of our wrist and finger. The less he needs the actual presence of other people, the more he will depend on goods and services to keep him company and populate his isolation. The more distracted and busy his isolation, the more he will measure people by their capacity to please him or to gratify him without getting in his face. For the only face he can bear will be his own. That's the end of my, of my sermon for today. And now I'll take questions happily. <clears throat> Bring it on. Thank you. So, uh, I agree with what you say that technologies are, uh, they can be used uh, for good or, or evil. And I think that uh, the internet, it's in a way a more democratic technology. So any, anyone that's willing to learn a little bit about it and break the, it, the entry point can can leverage it, uh, and in the, in this sense, I think it's better than uh, broadcasting technology like TV and radio, which are controlled by a small group of people that that they're basically using for their own interests. So I'll, I was just wondering if you have, uh, in addition to critiques, if you have any uh, insight on this specific topic and uh, ideas on how we can uh, provide the uh, uh, infrastructure like like the internet and prevent the kind of uh, the kind of issues that you point out in your book. Well, that, that's a very good question. Uh, for one thing, and I know it's, it's rather her heretical to say this in these precincts, uh, but it seems to me that the internet is taking on the formation of earlier capitalist entities, uh, and it is being controlled by large corporations, uh, which are buying up the social networking sites uh, and currently fighting over uh, another site uh, whose name begins with a Y. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that these are, these are really more amplified, more intense uh, reiterations uh, of, of early, earlier capitalist forms. Also, I'm very suspicious of populist arguments 
for democracy. Uh, because in the last century, uh, the most terrible totalitarian movements began with a populist base. And what concerns me is the way the individual voice is drowned out by all this rhetoric of the crowd, the wisdom of the crowd, uh, the page rank algorithm, which exalts popularity as the highest criterion of success. I don't know if democracy can express itself on, on that level. What I always look for in democracy is, it, is, is a society's ability to allow the individual to emerge from the mass with his individually, individuality intact so that the example of his individuality can inspire other people, inspire them to empower their own individuality. I see too often on the web individuality getting drowned in this mad rush towards popularity, towards the most generic appeal. So ideally, yes, the internet ought to be uh, an instrument, a vehicle for, for a, a, a magnification of democracy. But I'm afraid that it isn't at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> two things. One is uh, I'm not certain that it's worse than letting Rupert Murdoch decide what we're going to see. But my, my real question, it seems when I was growing up, there were like three news stations, you know, and everyone got their news from those three that were competing to be as broad as they could, to get as big a market as they could. And so everyone shared a certain information source, and we all knew when we were arguing politics or something, we all had the same information. Uh, what I'm seeing now with 500 channels of TV and the internet and all of these things is that a bunch of people can choose their sources of information that reaffirms their predisposed uh, attitudes towards things. And I no longer find that I share information sources with people when I'm trying to speak with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I talk to people who, you know, try to convince me that evolution isn't real and, you know, or any number of things. And I just want to say, well, where are you getting this? You know, um, so having lots and lots of choices and things seems to be leading towards a fracturing. You were, you were talking about culture as a shared experience, and now we no longer have that. Oh, exactly. Very eloquently put. And I, I don't address that in my book because it, it has been written about uh, uh, better uh, and, and eloquently by Cass Sunstein in a book called Republic.com, uh, where he talks about the echo chamber effect, which is exactly what you, what you so, so vividly described, where people get what, what Bill Gates calls, cheerfully calls customized information. What Nicholas Negroponte, uh, you know, of course you know who that is, calls the daily me. I, I, that, he made that term up, I guess, maybe 20 years ago or something like that where people just get news about themselves. I, I once saw a New Yorker cartoon, and it showed people uh, standing on a bus holding onto straps, commuters coming home, and they were all holding newspapers. But instead of the papers saying the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, the LA Times, the papers said the Daily Bob, uh, you know, the, 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 the Morning Louise, they were just reading papers about uh, news about themselves. And I think that is, that is the danger. That's the danger when you have an entity like the internet ruled by convenience. It really is, that is the strongest argument, the bottom line argument for the internet in every realm is it's convenient. Wikipedia is convenient. It doesn't matter if it says that you embezzled money, you know, when you were uh, working at a law firm. You'll, they'll change it. And anyway, it's convenient. We, we, that's that's the trade-off. Few inaccuracies, but convenience. Information from all these different sources, cutting people off rather than bringing them together because they don't have shared sources, it's convenient. You go on, you click, you get customized information. But convenience can be a terrible thing. You know, it's convenient for me to lie to you. It's convenient for you to lie to me. It's convenient maybe for, for somebody to take the pocket, my wallet out of my pocket. It's convenient to kill, to lie, to, to steal, to betray. I don't think that any entity ruled by conveni convenience alone can be humane. And I think one of the consequences is this 
atomization of, of information, this cult of information, in fact, right? Where information is just, and I think Google is, is partly responsible for this, where information is just good for its own sake, information. And we're told again and again and again, information is a necessity for democracy. Information is the marrow of democracy. Well, that's simply not true. In my book, I talk about how after the Civil War, uh, uh, during Reconstruction, and up until the Civil Rights Act in, in 1964, everyone had information about what was happening to blacks in the South. They were still being tortured and lynched. Everyone had this information. But only when the moral and, 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 and ethical framework of the society changed did the lot of blacks in the South change. Same thing of, in Germany in the 20s and 30s. The, 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 most, the most articulate and intelligent members of the society knew what was being done to, to Jews and homosexuals and, and gypsies and, and Catholics and dissenters. They knew about the slave labor camps. They had information. But the society had completely lost its moorings. And you only get those moorings through knowledge. Knowledge shows the interconnectedness of things. It puts information in a context. I, I, I think that at this point, what Google has to do is, is, is create alongside its, its information business a knowledge business. You know, I was thinking coming into San Francisco, I used to fly into Pittsburgh um, a lot I, for personal reasons. And Pittsburgh, of course, was where the original Robert Barons uh, made their fortunes. And they left behind, uh, well, after, at one point, they all packed up their cars and took a caravan to New York and planted themselves on Fifth Avenue. And they left behind in Pittsburgh these, these huge edifices to culture, museums, universities. Once in New York, they proceeded to build the same thing. And I was thinking about the dot-com revolution in the 80s, when you could uh, drive down San Francisco Street and see all these kids, basically, 22, 23 years old, $2 million in their checking accounts, smoking cigars, speaking loudly on the corners. That bubble burst. What did they leave behind? Just lots of empty pizza boxes. And I wonder what, what Google will leave behind. I, 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 I don't understand why Google is not, in fact, building great cultural edifices. Instead of doing business with libraries, building its own library. M moving away from the information ethos, or, or at least not moving away from it, but establishing a knowledge ethos to show the depth and the context of things instead of tearing things out of their context. Yes. So um, my sense is you, you do have this almost completely backwards in that the 20th century was the century of broadcast and the century of totalitarianism. Um, the fact that Hitler and Stalin could speak with one voice to the entire country <coughs> was what enabled that their good etats and their ability to control entire nations. The fact that they used this technology, yes. But, you are, but the internet is the opposite of broadcast technology because it enables all these multiplicity of voices that you're simultaneously condemning as the daily me. So you, you, you seem to have this, this sort of two-headed criticism here that, that is internally inconsistent with itself. The, the, my, the point is that it's the, the internet is not a commercial culture. It, it is a culture, um, it is, as Gas Sunstein says, it's, it's a gift economy broadly. Wikipedia is not a commercial entity. Um, and many of these other things are not commercial transactions. They are small individual transactions that because the transaction cost is so low, people are willing to engage in to, 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 to spread information and generate more knowledge. And um, your, your episode with the New Republic where you set up sock puppets to, to criticize, you were effectively slumming in that culture, um, saying, okay, this is, the, this is the worst of it. I will go and roll myself in the worst of it and behave in that way, rather than look at the way that you, were, you could engage with it and make it stronger. Well, you brought up many things. Let me take the last one uh, first. D are you aware of this Sprezzatura incident? I was a senior editor at the New Republic. Uh, the New Republic uh, circulation was down. The magazine was on the block. They tried a desperate strategy, uh, which was to use the internet uh, to raise subscriptions in a very particular way. They allowed people to come on to the New Republic website using aliases, so long as they were subscribers and to say whatever they wanted to say. Uh, no blog, no newspaper, no magazine, to my knowledge, has ever allowed that to happen. So they came on, and uh, they just said these things that, as 
I'd been on the master of the New Republic for 10 years, a practicing journalist for 10 years. I, I've never, I'd never seen before. I don't even want to repeat them. Uh, but the last straw was when uh, someone called me a pedophile. Now, I, have a, I just had a, a little baby boy, and these things stay on the internet forever. And I went, yet again, to the New Republic's editors. I had asked them several times and said, you know, why don't you, why don't you edit these things or, or block the worst of them? This is, this is libelous. This would not have happened just two or three years ago. And they said, this is the new policy. Love it or leave it. You know, give up your salary and your health benefits and go off somewhere else or put up with it. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, temperamentally, I was simply unable to allow these people uh, to make these comments. I had over the past several years, under my own name, criticized what I called thuggish anonymity. And I did that on my blog at the New Republic. I went after very passionately this convention of malicious anonymity. When I hit this brick wall, when the editors refused to cooperate with me, uh, I thought, you know, I'll give them a taste of their own medicine. I'll make a point. That's all. And because I had, well, because of the dynamics of things and because I had roused the ire of the blogosphere, uh, it was turned into something as, that, as William Sapphire said in the New York Times magazine, uh, rocked, rocked people from the Potomac to the Thames. But it was actually a very small incident. Uh, so that was that. As far as your, your other points, I think you're confusing the ideal with the real. I think you are saying that the, the internet ought to be a force for democracy. The, the internet ought to be non-commercial. By commercial, I don't, I don't just mean making money. What I mean, uh, as I tried to describe in that passage I read to you, commercialism is, is a way of being. When we're, we're in a transaction with someone, we participate in that. We don't surrender ourselves to, to, to what's going on. We don't just become a specta passive spectator. We aggressively participate. We, we, we try to change things. We reach in. We try to reshape. That, to me, is a commercial state of mind. That, to me, is what participatory culture, Web 2.0 culture, promotes. That's, that's my problem with it. That's the problem, my problem, with Wikipedia, never mind all the inaccuracies, which I think is another, another problem uh, with Wikipedia. And as to your first point about Hitler and Stalin, that, that's exactly my point. They used the, two, the new technologies of the modern era to affect their coup d'etat. I'm saying that this technology has to be examined so that it does not get flipped, so that democratic principles are not used to pervert democratic, democratic values, which was exactly what Hitler and Mussolini did. You, you, you're very passionate, yes. No, they're not. Well, it's useful if you're a Chinese blogger, but even in that case, and here is really where, where I, I get very skeptical about internet technology. If you're a Chinese blogger or a dissenting blogger, obviously you, 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 you vitally need uh, to, use, to use an alias to hide your identity. But once the government gets hold of the internet, and, th and this is the problem with the internet, there goes the multiplicity of voices. They've got the they can find out where you are. They've got the IP addresses of everyone. It's, it's, it, I don't know if the individual blogger, the dissenting anonymous blogger, could ever stand up to a government who seizes control of this entire entity with, with all its multiplicity. Well, 80% of their content is replication of free sources. 
Oh, and the internet also draws from it. Well, that's another issue, but I want to go back to the Iraq War because I don't think you would even have a blogosphere if it had not been for the Iraq War and for the Bush administration. If you had not had people feeling helpless and impotent before these criminals who, who just transparently were, were literally stealing the country, right? I mean, when the next guy gets into the White House, he'll probably find that there's no f furniture there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and just seeing these guys do it, listen, and brazenly, insolently just flying in our face with it, it made us all feel so helpless that the internet came just at the right moment. But what, 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 what upset me at the time was that the internet was not just a source of information. And I think you're wrong about the main, I think you're, you're, you're selling the mainstream media short. It was the New York Times that screwed up big time. Uh, but I got all the information I, I needed about what was really going on from The Guardian, for example. You know, the, gar the Guardians of, uh, Right. Well, the Herald Tribune also was, w made its mistakes. You know, it's, it's, it's financed by the Times. But the Guardian had everything that you could possibly uh, uh, want. But I think that if it hadn't been for the outrage uh, created uh, by the Bush people, you would not have had the blogosphere. And what bothers me about it is that it's often a catharsis. People get on these threads. Go, go on Atrios now, or, or even Daily Cost, which I think's gotten better. But look at the threads. After about 10 comments, they're completely off message. You know, people are arguing about, about you know, how to raise their kids, how to toilet train their kids, where to find parking. They're just going after each other, you know, trying to needle each other. And it becomes this catharsis. I don't think politics should be a catharsis. You know, it should keep you pissed. Art's a catharsis. Politics should keep you angry. But people go on these threads and then it's like, whoo, wow, okay, all right. So the guy, these bad guys are in the White House, but that felt great. And that, that to me, is, is the, the dysfunction in the political blogosphere that, that our absolutely dysfunctional politics has caused. Totally different way to go on this would be education. We were talking earlier about high school kids and digital natives versus digital immigrants. Did you look at any of uh, the issues around learning and how we just assume that everything's a click away, that I just get to look up information? Back to your comment about Google doing information versus knowledge. Well, you know, New York City had this laptop, that's a great question, uh, had this laptop program, which finally it abandoned because it found that the students were just, they were too distracted. You know, the, 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 this particular process of learning was taking them away from learning. They weren't making the connections. Also, g you give a kid a computer and, you know, forget it. You can't control what he's doing and there are a million distractions and everything's, the, the worst, not learning, but the worst distraction is a, is a click away. Uh, I, I think that... <sighs> I mean, there's no way to stop it. My, my son's 20 months old. By the time he's, he's 21, he'll, he'll live in a completely different uh, world from mine. But I do think that there's going to be a kind of book backlash. Uh, and I, I think eventually people will fuse the best aspects of the internet with the best aspects of the old print, print culture. There, there, there has to be a return to knowledge, interconnectedness, context. There, there has to be, I mean, we're, dis we're too distracted to stay distracted, right? Nobody even has the discipline to stay distracted anymore. I, I can't. Just too many things going on. So I think that there's, there's going to be a backlash uh, uh, against that. You know, I mean, this, this is just the, the kind of the, the first epoch, right, of, of, of the internet. There'll be all these changes and this restless dialectic going back and forth. Uh, how, how do you define the difference between information and knowledge? You seem to embrace knowledge. And don't, don't you think that having a choice between three stations and 500 stations is kind of, uh, it's a real plus. Depend well, as, as this man said earlier, you know, with, with the three stations, you at least had the advantage of sharing a common culture. When you have a multiplicity of information outlets, people can customize their information source, and then no one has a, has a, common, uh, a common vocabulary. 
Ideally, yes, again, ideally, and we have had the ideal of the internet thrust down our throats. Ideally, 500 outlets, 1,000 outlets, if they're all good, meaningful, substantial outlets, of course that's better than, 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 than the three. Anything's better than that, that old paradigm, the paradigm, the handful of music studios, a handful of networks, handful of book publishers. But in reality, is it working? Doesn't multi multiplicity create its, not just its exclusions, but also uh, its own hierarchies, you know, its own distortions, its own biases? Um, I'm a little confused by how a couple of your arguments interact. On the one hand, you seem to be objecting to the active engagement of individuals rather than the sort of passive absorption of, of, a, of an art or cultural um, experience. And on the other hand, you seem to be bemoaning the isolation of individuals and commodification of our relationships. And I'm not sure how those two... Am I, am I promoting the commodification of relationships? Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're bemoaning sort of isolation and, and inward-facing um, individual, individuals. And on the other hand, you're, you seem to be encouraging people to passively accept experience rather than actively engaging in relationships with other people. Oh, right. Yeah, well, that's an interesting distinction. I mean, there are certain, I'm all for engagement you know, uh, with, with other people. I just don't like when it's strictly transactional. And I do think that that passive contemplative enjoyment of art, whether it's high or popular, I don't, I don't think it's isolating. I, I, I think you, you blend into a common culture, into a common wisdom. You, you, you get out of yourself uh, and you begin to live uh, imaginatively in, in, in other, not vicariously, but imaginatively uh, in, other, in other people's lives. You know, Bruno Bettelheim, uh, the child psychologist. Uh, I'm, I'm always wary when I quote Bettelheim. He was a famous child psychologist, taught at University of Chicago, and I once had a friend who lived across the courtyard from him in Hyde Park, Chicago. Uh, and every day at four o'clock when the kids got out of school, he heard Bettelheim throw up at his window and the famous chi child psychologist scream in his German accent, shut up! So I'm, I'm always wary of quoting him. But he did say when he was not screaming at children, uh, he said that the, the, the television that literature captures the imagination, but that television seizes the imagination. And I, and I think that when you're passively contemplating something, you're, uh, you're, you're, your imagination is captured, but it's allowed to roam free. It's not just seized and taken away from you. I, I don't think it's isolating, reading a book or watching, watching a movie. Hey there. Um, you brought up a few interesting points that sort of brought new ideas into my mind, or things that I had seen all around, and I, I just wanted to bring those up. So, um, your point about the internet being like 70% pornography, um, I don't know the stats, but that sounds pretty pretty right. And it's interesting because I feel that through this convenience, people are becoming obese, so to, so to speak. I mean, there are certain dogs, right, that you give them unlimited food, they'll eat themselves to death. And humans have some of those tendencies, and it's with sex, and it's, and it's with food in our country, obviously. And, and I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm a little bit afraid of those things. And also, the convenience of the internet and becoming so transactional um, along with consumerism. So kind of bringing those three things together kind of equals loneliness um, and isolation. And I guess I'm just wondering where you think that, I mean, you know, there are a lot of really smart people here and maybe we can recognize, oh, this is the right thing to read or I only use the internet for good or, you know, that kind of thing. But I see where you're coming from. I, I kind of appreciate that perspective and, and also tying that in together with some you know, my grandfather saying these things, he's kind of equating, he, he doesn't really explain where he feels that we are, but he kind of equates, you know, world wars and, and you know, this like communism and, and to sort of this same sort of idea and following what other people say. It's like, think for yourself, you know, and it's just all of those things come together. You know, what's your response or are there any solutions in your mind or where, where are you at with all of this? Uh, well, I, I, I like your, I think I'm a little bit younger than he is, but I like your grandfather. Uh, I like where he's coming from. Uh, solutions, it's such an American thing. Everything has, has to have a solution. I, it's a, no, but it's a, it's a great question because you don't want to just be left with these problems, just like you don't want to have a novel taken away from you when you're in the, in the middle of it. I don't think a solution is, is, so, is so easy, you know. I think it's all a question of, of cultivating a consciousness in, in each of us. And as you said, there, there are some very 
uh, uh, smart people here, obviously, very smart indeed. And I, I, I think that all of us have to uh, have a consciousness of, of, of what's wrong with this technology, e even as we're seeking to improve it. You know, we, we know its virtues, we know its, its capacity for good, but we just have to start thinking, uh, you know, negatively, but in a positive way. We have to infuse negative thinking with a positive energy and begin thinking of, you know, worst case scenarios, bad scenarios, begin talking about the, the, the downside of the thing. When, whenever I get in a panel talking about this, people always bring up examples of the, of the best things about the internet. And, I, and I, I don't deny that, but that's not an argument. That's like saying, well, you know, you have a debate about cigarettes. Well, but cigarette, you know, nicotine is a most wonderful, calming thing in the world. Without cigarettes, you wouldn't have romantic Hollywood movies. You wouldn't have French existentialism, which maybe is a good thing. You wouldn't have the cafe. Think of all the good things. Yes, yes, but then there's the other thing. And I'm just saying that bringing up the good things, it's not an ar argument. It's, not, it's, it's an evidentiary uh, cry of protest. Um, but but we, we simply have to create a consciousness through debate, through discourse, through writing of, of what's, what's gone wrong with this, with this very young technology. Could you wait for the microphone, please? So, so my sense is that your, your Caliban raging is reflection in the mirror. You're, you're saying that um, the internet reveals humanity in all its ugliness and broadness, and you wish the internet looked more like you and your, the culture that you come from that established the media culture, the previous media culture that you're comfortable with. And that's, that, my, that, my, my, that seems to be what's behind your argument, is that you're, you're comfortable with the, the um, East Coast high culture um, that, that you are clearly a successful part of, um, and you're concerned that the internet is re revealing these other cultures that were suppressed by that, that media hegemony before. You know, it's funny that you should say that because I spent 10 years uh, raging Caliban-like against East Coast high culture. I must have angered every editor from the Times to the New Yorker to the Atlantic to Harper's. I would write for these magazines and then I would stop writing for these magazines. I'm not comfortable with any kind of uh, ex exclusi exclusivity. Uh, I'm not comfortable with any concentration of power. More than two people in a room and I break out in hives. I'm not comfortable with any kind of received opinion. No, I want to see internet culture to, to be, at its best, a true, original, dissenting culture. That's what I want. But I see it more and more becoming conventionalized. I don't think it has the most, I don't think it has the ugliest aspects of human, human nature by any means, but I do think that it has the most average uh, aspects of human nature. In other words, this, this lust for popularity for one thing, which, which I think is a terribly destructive force in internet culture. I think there has to be room allowed for the, for, for the individual existing outside page views. There has to be, there has to be room for, for losing, for failure, for setback. Internet culture is too, it's too much about success. It's driving people crazy. You're not allowed to fail on the internet. There should be, there should, instead of the most popular blogs, the, there should be the, the least popular. The most failed, the most unsuccessful. Do, do, do you remember uh, Howard Stern did a kind of uh, a, a send up, or rather retort to American Idol? He celebrated the worst, uh, Sanjay Amalakar. Do you, do you remember that? He celebrated the worst Idol contestants as a way to, t to turn upside down this obsession with popularity. Oh, no, I, I, I'd, I'd love to see all those marginal qualities uh, exalted and, and celebrate, celebrated. We have time for one more question. I'm wondering if this might not be self-repairing, that over time people realize that everything they see on the internet written in black and white is not truth, uh, that they learn uh, how to get knowledge uh, out of the sea of information. Uh, when you when when you compare American Idol or other you know pop TV things, those are also going after being the most popular, trying to reach a big audience in order to sell more stuff. Uh, it, that you know a lot of us don't watch that stuff uh, because it it is of no value. Uh, and in the same way, on the internet, you can find whatever you want. 
you don't necessarily have to go for the things that are, uh, that are most popular in that sense. What PageRank does is it says that this is a vote for this thing. Um, that's not always popularity. Um, you know, in, in a large sense, some of the things that have, have been done to PageRank since its inception are actually quality metrics, uh, where you know, it's not just that it, was, it had a lot of links, but that it has some other quality signals that, uh, that are used. And we have things like Google Scholar uh, and things like this. So I think that there might be, uh, just like on eBay, there are reputation systems where you say, you know, this guy is someone you can trust to deliver the goods once you pay them, uh, that there might be self-repair for a lot of the things that you're worried about. Uh, with reputation systems and things, you know, so that you're not just getting information, you're getting truth. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. Um, what you're describing is really a return to the old paradigm. But you had editors, for example, doing that, doing the filtering. And then we stopped, we stopped trusting them. But now we see that we need filtering from the bottom up. So you're really calling for a return to the same editorial uh, function that at one time was boldly pronounced obsolete. Uh, and and I, I, I think you're right. I do think that we're going to have to filter and edit and all of that. I think it's very hard to do that yourself. And I think that's why the old system kind of worked. You had a bunch of editors report. You had layers and layers of institutional controls, all of which were competing to some extent with each other and keeping each other honest. Uh, and now you're, you're saying, rightly so, one looks at the chaos and the anarchy uh, of, of the web and, 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 the, and the lack of truth that, 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 that can come in great bursts and storms and saying, we've got to learn how to edit that. Yes, but that's a return to the same kind of caretaker uh, sensibility uh, that once was, was, was proclaimed uh, obsolete. Lee Siegel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.